Well, good morning. It's good to see you. We're going to continue on in our series called Soundtrack. Today we're going to be looking at Psalm 23, so open your Bible. Go with me if you would. Psalm 23. And uh, while you're opening there, let me just say a big thank you to all of those that participated yesterday in our Emerge Outreach event here in the community. We had about 50 people from our church that went out into the community, and uh, we've got several of these planned throughout the year, but we went to uh, help two uh, ladies specifically that were widows. You know, one of the responsibilities that uh, we have as a church is to help the widows, and we see that in the book of Acts. And uh, we went and, you know, we had a great group of people that were able to go and basically uh, landscaping and cleaning up and, you know, build, building a porch, doing all kind of things, helping them out and uh, giving them gift baskets and all those great things because we wanted to be able to bless those uh, who are in need in our community. We want to be able to reach out to those who sometimes aren't able to help themselves and reach out for themselves. So I just want to say a big thank you to all of you guys that participated. What a great event. Let's give them a big round of applause. You know, that is part of our vision to emerge in outreach, and that doesn't mean just in world missions, which we do a ton in world missions, but it also means right here in our Jerusalem, in our community, right here, Jesus said, go into the world and start in Jerusalem. And um, so it, it's really exciting to see uh, how that happened and took place. I'm just proud of our church, man. It just, I'm proud of you guys. I think you're awesome in the work that God's doing in your life and what he's doing here. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the soundtrack of a shepherd in Psalm 23. Let's just read this, and then let's come back and talk about it a little bit. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We've entitled this particular series Soundtrack because we're looking at some of the famous psalms, if you will, and really Psalm 23 is probably the most popular psalm in the book of Psalms, most people have heard it, whether they're believers or non-believers. You know, Christians always like to say, we don't have unsaved, we have pre-Christians. So Christians or pre-Christians, you know, most people have heard of Psalm 23. And what Psalm 23 is, like so many of the Psalms are, they're soundtracks of praise. They're soundtracks of worship to God. Two-thirds of them written by uh, King David and uh, the other third written by a couple of other authors that uh, we, we don't really know. But um, it, and they're just songs of praise. That's what it means. That's what Psalms means. They're songs of praise. They're soundtracks of praise reflecting what God was doing in the heart of David, specifically Psalm 23. It's just sharing. I mean, he's just writing this song out saying, man, here is who God is and here's what God is doing in my life. And I love this, man. It just captures who he is and it captures who God is and what God is doing because when we look already in verse 1, Look at the very first part of verse 1. We're going to jump into this. Matter of fact, this is going to be over a two-week period because there's no way for me to adequately cover all of Psalm 23 in one week. So we're going to look at a few verses here and come back. So when I get, you know, an hour and a half into the message today and you're saying he's only on verse 3, you know, you, no, I'm just joking. Some of you that have never been here, you're like, seriously, an hour and a half, you know? Um, but look at the very first part, verse 1. Look what it says. The Lord is, help me. My shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd. I, I love David reflecting back. Here he is. Here's King David now. But he at one time was a young shepherd boy. If you remember the story of Samuel coming, looking to anoint a king, looking for who was going to replace Saul. And, and remember he went to the house of Jesse and Jesse had all of his sons and Samuel looked and he went through all of his sons. Not this one, this one, this one, this one. Do you have any more, any more sons? I mean, this is all you got. Well, no, there's this one little shepherd boy. He's the youngest of the, the group. He's the little runt that's in the back. Well, go get him. And so, you know, they went out and brought David in and Samuel looked and he said, that's the guy right there. David was a young shepherd boy out tending his flock, out tending his herd of sheep. And so he's recalling back those days as a shepherd. And he uses the analogy of a shepherd to capture the essence and heart of how God was taking care of him in his life. And he used this as a soundtrack of praise. And he says, the Lord is my shepherd. And I like when he writes this because he doesn't say, you know, the Lord is the shepherd of all of Israel, which is true. But he was making it personal. He was saying, the Lord is my shepherd. 
And I want us to make this personal in our lives today, that the Lord is my shepherd. God is here just for you. He's not just here for living waters. He's not just here for our community, not just here you know, for our state and our world and all those things. God is your shepherd, you personally. And that's what separates us from every other religion is that it's really not a religion, it's a relationship. And he says, the Lord is what? The Lord is my shepherd. I'm personally involved with him. He's personally involved with my life. And, and I don't want you to miss the magnitudes that the creator of the, the magnitude of these words, that the creator of the universe is personally involved with you as a sheep. And we think of sheep, oh, how cute. Oh, they're just so cute and fluffy. They're just... Let me tell you a couple of characteristics about sheep. They are dumb animals. <laughs> sheep are dumb. They're, they're just not right. I mean, they're nearsighted. I know these, these aren't your characteristics, but characteristics of sheep. They're nearsighted. They're stubborn. They, you, you know, they're, they're easily frightened. They have little means of defense. If, if you leave them in a pasture by themselves, they'll completely ruin it without a shepherd. And that's often the analogy we get as, as, as those who follow Christ. We're sheep. The Lord is my shepherd. We need a shepherd because we're, most of the times we're nearsighted. We're stubborn. Left to our own demise, we'll mess everything up. The Lord is my shepherd. And look at verse 1, the second part. The Lord is my shepherd. And because the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. I have need of nothing and you're sitting here today and you say well pastor Ed, that kind of doesn't make sense because verse 4 says that even though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death or even though i'm going through a dark valley i mean if i'm going through a dark valley evidently there's some needs that i would have no i don't want us to get this confused because there's a big difference between needs and wants god is all we need that's what david is saying here god is all i need and I, 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 don't, I don't want us to get this misconstrued here because sometimes we look at life and we compare ourselves. And you know, that's the worst thing that we can do. I didn't say this in the other services, but I just feel that to say here, we need to be careful and not get into the comparison game. We need to be real careful that we don't compare ourselves to other and what others and what other people have and what other people are doing and, and all those things because what it does is it creates discontent in our lives. And when the discontent is there, all of a sudden we have these feelings of, oh, well, I need this to make me happy. Or if I had these things or these needs, it would make me somebody. And listen, David is saying, you don't need all those things. You're getting your needs and your wants really, really mixed up. Because when it's all said and done, here's the deal. Here's the common denominator in all of Psalm 23 is God. That God is there the whole time. That God is all you need. God is all you need. And when you have God in your life, look what he's saying. I lack nothing. And the good thing is, is you guys that are sitting here today, I would venture to say 100% of you, every single person here, that God has provided for you. you. You may not understand that. You may not understand the context of that phrase or what I just said. But I want to tell you that God has provided for you. He has made provision for your life. And that you guys here today, you're some of the most blessed people in the entire world. Most everybody here, you're in the top 5% of people living a wealthy life in this world. I was just looking, I, I shared this a little bit last week. If you make $5,000 a year, you're in the like top 3 or 4% in the whole world. And some of you are doing a whole lot better than that. And you're in an elite upper group. God has made great provision for you. And we need to make sure that we separate some of that though and understand that God, it's not the money that I need, it's not all the stuff that I need, that God is all I need. Jesus, the good shepherd, Jesus is all I need. Now, here's the thing. It's not all we get. God is all we need, but God gives us so much. God blesses us in so many ways, and that's what this soundtrack is. It's a soundtrack of reflection of how good God is. You know, you see some of the other soundtracks of the Psalms and some of the other songs of praise are also songs of, you know, kind of crying out to God and, you know, a woe is me and I'm having a tough time or I'm having a hard time. But in this particular psalm, David is reflecting on how good God has been. And sometimes we need to stop. I'm getting ready to get wound up here. But sometimes we need to stop and take time to just reflect on how good God has been. Have you ever heard people, you know, th think about it. When you hear of people going through 
different circumstances that are going through tough times or difficult times. You know, maybe you hear about a marriage that's fallen apart and, you know, maybe there's a family, a husband and wife that are in the process of getting a divorce. Or maybe you hear about somebody who just, you know, found out that they had a terminal illness. You know, sometimes when you hear those situations, you hear different things. Uh, and, and this isn't in a bad way, but don't you sometimes stop and reflect and just, you're like, man, God, thank you. Thank you that, you know, I'm, I'm not going through that. Thank you that, that I'm not in that place in my life. And it's a reflection. It brings us back to reality. That's what Psalm 23 is. It's bringing us back to reality, bringing, us, uh, bringing praise to God, saying, Lord, thank you. I want to reflect that you are so good to me and that the Lord is my shepherd. And because the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. I have all I need. Look at verse 2. Here's what we get. With, when the Lord's your shepherd, look what, look what you get. It's a, it's a good deal. Let me tell you, this is a really good deal. How many of you like good deals? This is a good deal because the good deal in this is you don't have to do anything for it. He does it for you. Because the first few verses have nothing to do with your activity. Sometimes we think it's our activity that gets the job done. You know, that if we give up ourselves, it has nothing to do with your activity. The shepherd does it for you. Look at this. The Lord's my shepherd. I like nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. You know, I love playing golf. I, I love, oh, I love golf. I love golf. I love playing golf. Oh, man, I love golf as much as I love church almost. I, I just love, I love golf. And, uh, but one of my favorite courses to play is Tuscany Reserve. It's about five minutes away from here. And when I go play there, and go with some buddies and stuff, and I end up taking some of their money and things like that. And we don't, there's no gambling. Pastors don't gamble. There may be friendly wagers, but there's no, there's no gambling. Okay. And, um, and, and so, you know, I'll, I'll go play, play golf, and, you know, when I get out to this course, it's just plush, beautiful, lush, green landscaping everywhere. It's just gorgeous. I get out there sometimes, and I'm like, I just want to go out here and ride around in the cart and lay down under a tree, you know what I mean? It's just, oh, you know, it's just, it's just beautiful out there, and that's kind of the image I get when, when, when I read these words, he makes me lie down in green pastures. You kind of just get now. Can you imagine just a plush green pasture under a tree, the cool breeze of the day, no noise, no TV, no radio, none of those things that, I mean, just laying there in complete relaxation. That's what God does. He wants to bring you to peaceful rest. He wants to make you lay down in green pastures. He wants you to have rest in your life. He wants to bring nourishment into your life. Timothy Keller in his book, A Shepherd's Look at Psalm 23, says that in order for a sheep to lie down in a pasture, that that sheep has to be free of four things. The first thing that he has to be free from is he's got to be free from all fear. He can't have any sense. If a sheep has any sense that there's danger around or anything like that, he won't be able to rest. That sound familiar? Some of you are here today, right now, and you're having a hard time resting because you feel like there's fear all around you. Fear of the future, fear of the unknown, fear of what could happen, fear of losing your job, fear of a marriage falling apart, fear of what your kids may do, and you're all fearful, and as a result, you lay down at night, you can't sleep, there's no rest, there's just no peace. And look what it says, that the shepherd, he comes along, and he pushes the danger back. And he causes us, and that, when it says makes, it also means causes. He causes us to lay down. He causes me to lay down. He removes all fear. That's what the shepherd does. The shepherd brings protection. He removes all fear. Here's another thing. Sheep won't lie down in pasture if they feel any friction. They have to be free of friction within the flock or within the herd. They, there can't be any kind of power plays going on with the other sheep. Isn't that interesting? Sometimes in life, we have friction with individuals, and we have friction with one another. And, and by nature, we just have conflict sometimes, and that's why one of the greatest things that the church needs to do is be in unity. And that's why our number one core value is unity, so that we're free of friction. We don't want to have friction in our life where there's friction and there's unrest. We don't, we don't want to have We want to walk together in unity. And that sheep need to be free of friction with other sheep. And here's another thing. They won't lie down if they're tormented by flies and parasites. Let me just tell you what this, this is. And uh, some of you are tormented. You're like, man, I was wondering what that was around my face when I was walking. <laughs> and, but what would happen is the mucus in the nasal cavity of sheep, and I don't want to get too graphic. Some of you are like, whoop. And, but as it would begin to come out, it would attract fleas 
it would attract parasites, flies, all kind of insects and bugs and all that, that they would begin to attach themselves or come to. And so it would get up in the nasal cavity and would just torment the sheep. When those flies and those bugs and all those parasites, it would just get all and cause infection and all that. So when we see the last part of this, and we'll look at this next week. You guys with me today? When we look at this next week, it's going to be really good. Because where it says he, that he anoints my head with oil. He anoints my head, meaning that the shepherd comes. And what the shepherd would do is bring oil and anoint or rub on the sheep's face or on that nasal cavity to prevent the flies and the insects and the bugs from tormenting the sheep. And so he anoints me with oil. He, he, he helps me be free of the torment. And I want to tell you here today, some of you are tormented in life right now. There are people that are sitting in this room right now and you feel the torment of the enemy. You feel the bugs all around you. You feel the flies. You feel like the parasites of life have grabbed onto you. Look, the good shepherd, God, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He wants to bring peaceful rest to your weary soul today. Sheep won't lie down also if they feel like they're in need of food. If they feel hungry or if they feel like they're, they have some of those hunger pangs going on, they, they won't lie down if they feel like they're in need of food. So he provides nourishment for them. He makes them lie down in green pastures, meaning that he brings freedom of fear. He brings freedom of friction. He brings freedom from the flies and freedom from famine. Look at verse 2. He leads me beside quiet waters. I love that. Jesus is the good shepherd who, who leads us. And, and the reason it's important for us to be led because Isaiah 53 says this, that all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned to our own ways, it says. We, we've all gone astray. We do our own thing. Without a shepherd, we end up in a rut. We end up going in circles. We end up just wandering all over the place. We end up just doing our own thing. We end up living our lives in danger. But what does it say? He leads me. The shepherd leads me beside quiet waters he helps me so that i'm not stuck in a rut he helps me because if i'm left alone i'll feel helpless i'm helpless in life without a shepherd and he leads me he goes ahead of me he leads me look at verse three and he refreshes my soul i love this part because in the first couple of verses what we have is physical activity we have i mean physical rest we have the physical aspect of of what the shepherd does for us he brings rest and peaceful rest to us he helps us find nourishment and all of those things but his ultimate goal look at this the ultimate goal is spiritual restoration and we think it's an activity that if we do enough activity then we're going to be able to find restoration in our souls. We're going to be able to be refreshed in our souls. It doesn't have anything to do with your activity. The shepherd does it. What the shepherd is saying is, I'm going to help you find rest. And when you begin to rest in Christ, you're going to find spiritual restoration. When you begin to rest yourself and you rest your heart and you rest your will and you rest your mind and you rest your desires and you rest your will and your decision, when you rest all those things on Christ in him and through him and you stop trying to do it all by yourself and you stop trying to get in the activity of life, when you rest in him, you're going to find your soul is refreshed. If you're tired, he refreshes your soul. If you're, if you're weary, he refreshes. If, if you're in fear, he refreshes your soul. He comes along today to refresh your soul. If you're struggling, if you need healing, he refreshes my soul. And I like this. Look at verse 3. Look at verse 3. He guides me along the right paths. I like another version that says that he guides me in paths of righteousness. I like that. He guides me along the right paths, or he guides me in paths of righteousness. It isn't interesting. Look, look at the first part of verse 2. He leads me beside quiet waters. Verse 3, he guides me. They, they sound, he leads, he guides. Sounds kind of redundant, doesn't it? He leads, he guides. But you realize that there's a significant difference between being led and being guided. Big difference. He leads us because we need direction in our life. But he also provides guidance for us. You know, as a kid, I used to go to the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., uh, I've told you about my dad. He used to take us on trips. And you, we used to, I, I loved it. There was just something. I used to love going to D.C. Not so much now. But um, I, I just, 
I used to just love as a kid going to all the museums and doing all the things and having fun. And we go in and we go to, you know, the Air and Space Museum and we go to the Museum of Natural History. And, you know, we do all those different things. It, I just had a ball. And, and oftentimes there were guides that we would have. Maybe you've been to an art exhibit and you have a guide or you've been somewhere and you've been on a tour or something, you have a guide. The guide's job is not just to lead and just, okay, let's go, you know, and they just take off and you just follow. The guide's job and responsibility is that as you go together, he leads you, but he also guides you. And there are certain points along the journey or the tour or the trip or wherever you are, there are certain points where he stops you and helps you learn something or brings you to a place of discovery that you didn't know about before. So he guides me. He guides me in paths of righteousness. He leads me in a direction, but then he stops along the way. He doesn't just take off. He doesn't just say, hey, yo, sheep, come on, let's go. He's a good shepherd. He doesn't just take off ahead of us and say, let's roll, guys. But along the way, as we're going, he stops and he guides us. And he says, now I want to show you there's a place in life right here, and I want you to see some things. There are some things in your life right here that I want you to discover, some things that I want to show you. He guides me in paths of righteousness. And I want to tell you, we need to be guided in paths of righteousness because life is a jungle. In the words of Axl Rose of Guns N' Roses, the famous theologian, (laughs) welcome to the jungle. (laughs) Life is a jungle, isn't it? I remember John Ortberg years ago using this analogy of Psalm 23. Could you imagine going on a safari or you go to the jungles of Africa because you're just kind of really into the whole nature thing and you want to be a part of it. And so you pay the fare, you take the trip, you get over and and you've got your guide there with maybe 10 or 15 other people who are all going on this safari, all going into the jungle together. They're going to all experience this incredible thing, see the animals, see the danger, all those exciting things. And some of you are like, no, I'd rather just stay at a Marriott. But, you know, and so you're doing all this stuff and you get out into the jungle, you're, you're being guided by the tour guide. And you get out there, you notice your shoe's untied, you lean down, you tie your shoe, but there is thick brush everywhere. You, you have to stay close by. There's thick brush everywhere, and all of a sudden you tie your shoe, you look up, and everybody's gone. They've left. And for a moment, you stand up and you begin to call out, and there's no answer. Did they go to the left? Did they go to the right? Did they go straight? Where did they go? Could you imagine being over in a jungle in Africa, all by yourself, in the middle of nowhere. You don't know which direction to go. Where, could you imagine the feelings of fear, being out there with wild animals, afraid for your life, the anxiety? Can you imagine those emotions? Do you know what you would need in that moment? You would need a guide who understood the way. And you see, our, our jungle today, it's, it's hospitals, it's, it's court systems, it's, it's banks, it's finances, it's government. It's, we, we live in a jungle with so many things around us, and sometimes we get lost in the jungle of life. We get lost, we get discouraged, we have anxiety. And it's in those moments that more than anything, because here's the thing, we weren't created for it. We were created for God. But yet we find ourselves living in this jungle And when we're in this jungle, what we need more than anything is a guide who knows the way out. He guides me in paths of righteousness. He helps me. He directs me. I I love this. And I don't know about you, but let me just ask you a question. How many of you want direction from the Lord? I do. I think most of us do. I think most of us would say, I, don't, I think you would have to be stupid to say, no, I just would rather live my life on my own. I think people that say that kind of stuff, they just have no clue. Because look, left to our own, our own demise, we're a mess. We're a mess. And so for the most part, I, there may be some exceptions to the rule, but even if you're here today and you say, I'm one of those people that just want to carve out my own way and do my own thing and... You know, I don't need other people or I don't need religion or I don't need God to do it. I can make my own way. I want to tell you there will come a time in your life and there will come a moment. And I don't know at what point that will happen. I don't know when and how that's going to take place. But there's going to come a time in your life when all of a sudden you're tying your shoe and you stand up and realize that you don't know the way out. 
there's a good shepherd that directs us. He guides us, and it's in that direction. And you say, well, how, how do you find the guide, man? How, how do you find God's will? Man, I, I want God's will in my life. I want God's direction in my life. We all say that. I want God's direction, but I find myself not being able to know. I, I, how do I find God's direction for me? I'm in a place right now. And I know that there are some of you here. You're in a place right now. You want God's direction, but you don't even know where to get that or where he is or how to find it or anything like that. Let me tell you where God's guidance and direction come from. It comes from being close to the shepherd. Jesus said in John 10, verse 27, he said, my sheep, he said, they know my voice. I, I can just whisper. I don't have to scream at them. I don't have to yell. My sheep, they follow me. They, they know my voice and they follow me. They hear me. They recognize me. And so if you want God's direction for your life, if you say, man, I want Jesus to guide my life and there's some critical, crucial things that are taking place in my life, get close to the shepherd. Get close to the shepherd. Get close to Jesus. And I want to tell you, he's not far off. He's not far off. He can hear your voice call him. And if you'll call out to him, he'll appear right in that moment. He's waiting. He's anxious. Revelation says that he's standing at the door knocking, waiting to come in. You remember that last week? Who is this king of glory? Lift up, you know, your heads, O ye gates, be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. See, he stands at the door and knocks. He wants to come in. And if you'll just open up your life, if you'll just open up your heart and say, Lord, I want your direction for my life. I want the good shepherd. I want you to come and lead me in paths of righteousness. Look at this last part. Look at this last part that we're going to look at here today. For his name's sake. I like this. For his name's sake. His name, listen. His name is the only name on the marquee. It's not your name. It's not you. It's his name. It's for his name's sake. You know, maybe some people could read this and not having an adequate understanding of God's word could think, man, seems to me like God's got an ego problem. Seems to me like God's got a pride problem, man. God's got issues where he, he's, he's got some ego where, well, why is it that he gets all the praise? Uh, why is it that God gets all the glory? Why is it that he's the only one deserving of everything? What about me? Why can't I get a little praise? Why can't I get a little glory? Now listen, God doesn't need it, but he receives it and he gets it because he knows you can't handle it. If you were to get it, you would be a mess. You get a little praise, you get a little glory, all of a sudden you begin to come, become a hero in your own mind. And you stray and you go off. It's what pride does. That's what pride does to us. It makes us think that we're way better than what we really, really are. It's for His name's sake. Lord, help us to live our lives in a humble way. Help us to not take ourselves too seriously. Some of you guys are taking yourself way too serious. Nobody else is taking you that serious. <laughs> Trust me. Stop taking yourself so seriously because here's the th if you continue in that mode, God has a way of allowing you to be humbled. It's like the guy at church, man, he was so excited. They gave him a, you know, an award for being the most humble man in the church. And he got the award and he wore it and then they took it away from him because he wore it, you know. I mean, God, God has a way of humbling you. You know, I, I remember being humble. <laughs> I was in college. I was in Bible college. And uh, I was in my official first year of flunking out of Bible college. <laughs> And does that make you feel really good that your pastor flunked out of Bible college? How does that make you feel? You know? So, I, you know, and there are parents here today like, please don't tell my kids that they're here today, you know. And um, so, you know, I, I, I went to my classes when I had to, you know. And, uh, but I remember, you know, I thought it was the big cheese. You know, I had a group of friends. We all thought we were the big deal on campus and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I went to Southeastern University. And, I, I, you know, we just thought we were all that. You know, I thought that I was just God's gift to women. I, you know, I just... <laughs> Christy is one of the luckiest women alive. 
you know. But God had a way of humbling me one day, and I went to one of my classes, and I was sitting in the back because it was the best place to sleep. And uh, so I went back to the back of my class, and I was sitting back there. And, and you know how you do stuff? Have you ever, like, done stuff to try to make yourself stay awake? Um, you know, like, you know, poking at yourself or pinching at yourself. Some of you are here today, or, you know, maybe your wife is, <clears throat> wake up, you know, and I hope that's not you right now. But, you know, you do stuff to make yourself stay awake, and, and so I'm just bored out of my mind. I'm, I'm sleepy, I'm tired, but I'm like, don't go to sleep, because one time I went to sleep, and they all left me in the class for like two hours, and even the professor was like, <laughs> dismiss the class, and I'm in the back, <laughs> you know. And, and so, anyway, I was in this class, it was, just, it was just, you know, and I'm just trying to stay awake, and I had a pen in my hand, and I had the pen up at my head, what I thought was the back of the pen, <laughs> and I start poking myself in the forehead trying to stay awake. raccoon eyes and I looked up at my buddy and he's like <laughs> he's like oh my gosh <laughs> he's like Ed and all of a sudden I looked at the back of the pen I'm like <laughs> I had no idea and my face looked like you know a, a two-year-old had been playing Etch-A-Sketch, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I, I didn't even know the, how bad it was till I got to the bathroom, and, you know, I, I was like, I, I look like, my face looks like a Grand Prix track, you know? And so, you know, and so he's, I'm like, how bad is it? It's really bad. It's really bad. Put your head down. And so I'm like this now for the rest of the class and have to wait for everybody to leave. You know, I felt like the biggest fool in the world. And I get to the bathroom right outside the door, and I looked up, and I was just, I was just horrified. I mean, just humiliated because now I've got to walk from the bathroom back to my dorm. And I did my best even in the bathroom, you know, just trying to get the ink off. But it, was, it wasn't permanent, but it had that permanent effect for a little while. And so... You know, and it's just, God humbled me, man. It was just like, let me take you down because you're really not that good. <laughs> Don't take yourself so seriously. God has a way of bringing us down and helping us to understand and see that it's for his name's sake. Sabrina, come on up if you would. It's for his name's sake. It's not for me. It's for God. I love this particular passage of scripture is basically all I have to do is follow eat rest and stay close and if I do those things man the shepherd is right there he's right there let, let me go back to this I'll, I'll close with this let me let me go to this passage this verse he guides me in paths of righteousness one of these days, there's going to be an incredible party that is thrown in heaven. It is the party to end all parties. It's like you can't even imagine. As a matter of fact, those that are going to attend, those that are going to be there, some of the great heroes of the faith. People that we read about, even today, King David, he's going to be at the party. The, the guest list, impressive. But what's cool about the guest list is not how impressive the names are that are on it, but what's impressive is that none of them have egos. That there's only one person who stands out above the rest in all of it for his name's sake. And this party that is going to be thrown in heaven is, like I said, it's going to be the party of all parties. And this party that I'm going to, that party has no more death, no more sickness, no more depression, no more suffering, no more anxiety, no more fear. No more failing health, all a thing of the past. And it's going to be like you cannot even imagine. Our, 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 
our wildest imagination, we cannot even comprehend and imagine what God has prepared for us. We, we can't even grab it. Don't, and I want, can I just encourage you as a kid? We were talking about this the other day uh, in, in a meeting that we had. You know, as a kid, I had these warped ideas of what heaven was going to be like, you know? Like these weird ideas. And I want to tell you, what God has pre- prepared and planned for us is beyond anything that we can comprehend. That it is more real and it is more tangible than what we have right here, right now. It's more real than this physical atmosphere and world that we live in because what we have here was birthed out of the spiritual. So the spiritual is more real than this. Does that help you a little bit? That heaven is not going to be us just floating around and, you know, that God has so much planned and prepared in store for us. I want to be a part of that. And here's the thing, that party and, and to get admission into that, there's only one condition. Here's, here's, the, here's the ticket. The price is steep. Listen, the price is really, really steep. You've got to be right. You've got to be right. How do you get right? He leads me or guides me in paths of righteousness. To, to get right, you've got to go along the path of righteousness. And in the path of righteousness, it, it's up a steep hill. It's up a, a narrow road. It's up a, a winding road that goes way up this steep hill. And it, it takes a little bit to climb there. But when you get there, you arrive at the foot of a cross. And it's at the foot of the cross that we all find ourselves together. The greatest common dom- denominator that we have is the cross of Christ. It doesn't matter our socioeconomic backgrounds. It doesn't matter where, you know, what side of the tracks you grew up from or what country or what city you grew up in. All those things. None of those things matter here today. What brings us all together is the blood of Jesus Christ. There's a common denominator that we all find at the foot of the cross. And it's at the foot of the cross that we receive life. It's at the foot of the cross that we leave our baggage, we leave the guilt, we leave the shame, we leave the sin, we leave the fear, we leave all those things behind, and we get our admission, we get our ticket into heaven. He guides me in paths of righteousness. He leads us to Christ. God leads us. The Holy Spirit leads us. He encourages us, takes us to the cross. And that's what the shepherd wants to do for you. He wants to guide you. He wants to guide you to the cross. Maybe you're here today and you've never been to the cross. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ was a lamb of God, the Bible says, and he was led to slaughter for you and for me. Because the price of sin was, was so great. The, the admission price into heaven was greater than anything that we could pay for, even with our own lives. We, we couldn't get in. But God sent his son into the world that we might have life. That he would take our place, and as a perfect sacrifice, he would take our place, redeeming all of mankind and redeeming our lives so that we can go to the cross and receive the righteousness of Christ, the right living. We can receive the righteousness of Christ imputed into our lives and on our lives so that we can go to heaven. And if you're here today and you've never received Christ, The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Christ from the dead, you will be saved. It's as easy as, and I don't want to make light of it, I just want you to understand that it's not in your labor, it's not in your activity, it's in your heart and it's in your confession. It's in believing in your heart, it's in making a public declaration and saying, God, today I say yes to you. I make my way up that road and and I stand at the foot of the cross today. And I say yes to Jesus in my life. Pray with me. Bow your heads. Father, today, I want to pray for everyone here. God, I thank you for the 23rd Psalm, the Psalm of reflection, the Psalm of encouragement, the soundtrack of praise that resounds loudly in our lives to help us realize how good we really have it. God, we have got it really, really good. Lord, there's nobody here that should be discouraged today. There's nobody that should be down. I know life beats us up a little bit, and sometimes we get in the jungle and and we don't know the way out. But Lord, that you're our shepherd. You lead us. You guide us. That you're right there. That when we call out to you, you're right there. We know your voice. God, guide us today and direct us. And Father, I also pray for those that, that need to say yes to you, that are standing in the cross And Lord, not just at the cross, some of them are at the crossroads. And they're trying to decide what they need to do. Lord, I pray that they would make a decision for you today to say yes to God in their life, to say yes to Jesus in their life, 
to turn from their old life, to turn from their sin, and to say yes to Christ. If you're here today and you say, Ed, I need to pray, man. I want to get my life right with God. Pray with me. Jesus, come into my life and be my good shepherd. I've been out wandering around by myself. I've been out wandering through the jungle of life, and I'm lost, and I need direction. I say yes to you. I say yes to your leadership, your, your lordship in my life. Come in, take over. I, I, just, I, I just release, I just give you everything. I ask you to forgive me of the sin that's in my life, the things that have separated me from you, all the times that I've said no, and right now I just leave all those things behind. I leave all the baggage right here. I'm not taking it out with me today. It's not going to the car with me. I'm leaving all the baggage, all the emotional baggage. I'm leaving all the sin baggage. I'm leaving all those uh, addiction baggages. I'm leaving all those here today at the cross, and I'm walking out free. I receive you as the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen with me. Do me a favor. Let's